Thank you, Mark. I have a correction to make. Uh, the passage is not first, uh, 2 Timothy 1, 15 through 18, but no, it is. It's not 12 through 18. See, I'm confused. The fault was mine, not the secretary's. I gave her the wrong uh, uh, references, and uh, I can't explain why. But uh, anyway, we're going to begin with verse 15 in our scripture reading. 2 Timothy 1, beginning with verse 15. You are aware of the fact that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phagellus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he was in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. The Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know very well what services he rendered at Ephesus. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. I just made a mess up here. <laughs> I baptized the pulpit, incidentally. <laughs> By sprinkling, not immersion. <laughs> and this pulpit needed cleaning, I can see. It is, <laughs> wow. Okay, I'll stop. One of Shakespeare's greatest tragedies is King Lear. Story of old Lear losing his kingdom, his family, his sight, and his mind. But through it all, he had a loyal friend, the Earl of Kent, who was friend enough to speak honestly to the king and tell him what he didn't want to hear. And for that, the king banished Kent from the country. Nevertheless, when Lear was in desperate straits, homeless and sightless, Kent returned, hiding his identity, he became the king's servant, cared for him, and at one point guided him out of a raging storm into shelter. That's loyalty personified, someone wrote. A true friend, a help in time of need, and it's biblical. Proverbs 18, verse 24 says, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Such people exist outside the pages of fiction. Paul had such a friend. And when Paul was in dire straits, forsaken and in chains, his friend went to him and helped him. Paul speaks of this in our passage, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. Those were dark, dark days for the early church. Paul spoke of his friend, not to memorialize him, but to encourage Timothy who was fearful. Truth was under attack. Paul told Timothy to guard it, guard the treasure, guard the gift that he had been given, guard the gospel that had been entrusted to him. Don't be ashamed of it of the testimony of our Lord, or of his prisoner. Speaking of himself. Onesiphorus was not ashamed of Paul. Paul says, he was not ashamed of my chains. Be encouraged, Paul was telling Timothy. Here's one who stood firm. God enabled him. See that as an example. See that as encouragement. Be like that. Stand firm. Be vigilant. Fight the good fight. Paul needed more than a friend. Paul needed a fellow soldier because where Timothy was in Ephesus, people were forsaking the apostle and forsaking the gospel. A great church was under siege. And so... To bolster Timothy's faith and resolve, he told him about the courage and the love of Onesiphorus. 
But to add force to that, Paul reminds Timothy of the fear and the failure of those around him. Everyone had deserted him. They were all afraid to be associated with Paul. You are aware, he writes, of the fact that all who are in Asia turned away from me. It's one thing to help when it's easy to do, when it's encouraged by everyone. But when no one is willing, when a person has to act alone and against popular opinion, run to the sound of the guns when everyone else is running away, now that takes courage. That was the situation in Ephesus. And that's surprising when you think of the, the history of that church and of all of Asia. Luke wrote of it in Acts chapter 19, the church of Ephesus was born in a great revival. Mark Newman gave two excellent lessons on Acts 19 a year ago, so some of you who were there are going to get some review here. Those of you who didn't listen should uh, listen to those lessons by Mark. Ephesus was an important city. It was the Roman capital of the province of Asia, which was the western part of Asia Minor of modern-day Turkey. Today, Ephesus is a ghost town. You can walk down its streets and you can stand at its harbor where its once busy piers now go out into empty fields three or four miles from the Mediterranean Sea. But in Paul's day, it was an active metropolis. It was a rich city. Ephesus was called the treasure house of Asia. Paul came there and stayed for two years preaching the gospel, first in the synagogue until he was, he was kicked out, and then in the school of Tyrannus where they rented rooms and he taught. In fact, Luke writes that as a result of that teaching and that preaching, all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. He wrote that God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. He healed the sick. Diseases and demons went out of the afflicted. People believed the gospel and, and repented of their evil ways. The practice of sorcery, black magic, the occult was widespread in, in Ephesus and that region. And the people gave it up and burned their books and charms. It was a great bonfire of the vanities there in Ephesus. It was a genuine revival, not only in Ephesus, but as I say, across Asia. Luke wrote, So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. Prevailing against the evil one. And a church was established there right in the capital of the cult of Diana, the goddess of the hunt. And she had captured many souls, but the gospel Paul preached rescued many. It was a huge defeat for the devil, but the devil never sleeps and never gives up. And as time passed, he counterattacked and planted fake believers in the church. It's the parable of Matthew 13, verse 25, of the enemy that came at night, and when all were asleep, he planted tares among the wheat and then went away. Now that's his scheme, and that is always what he does. So those first heady days of revival were soon followed by days of division and defection. That's what happens. The battle is never over. The devil is always prowling about as a roaring lion. So Paul was not surprised by what had taken place. After he left Ephesus, you will remember, he met the elders of the church at Ephesus at Miletus along the, uh, the Asian coast. He gave them a final farewell, and Luke writes of it in Acts 20. He told them, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock. I know 
that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And so it will always be. God gives us great victories. But defeat is always sniffing at its heels like a bloodhound. So Paul told Timothy, guard the treasure. Retain the standard. Don't be ashamed of it. Lots of professing Christians were ashamed of the gospel and ashamed of Paul the prisoner. All who are in Asia turned away from me. Augustine called the apostle a veritable lion, a red lion, the great lion of God. He seemed like that during the revival, preaching and performing miracles. But something had happened. Maybe his arrest and second imprisonment in Rome was the case. The, the grammar of his statement seems to suggest that he's referring to a specific thing, a specific incident. People may have seen his chains as a, a defeat for him and, and a signal that the cause of Christ was lost. So they scattered. Paul singles out two men for special notice, Phagellus and Hermogenes. I think the attention he gives to them suggests that they may well have been the ringleaders of the defection. It, it seems to have been more than a, a personal desertion. They had turned from the Lord's apostle. They had turned from the servant of Christ perhaps denying his apostolic authority. That's a problem that Paul faced from the very beginning. You know, he wasn't one of the twelve, and he deals with this in the book of Galatians, which is probably the first book that he wrote. So early on, he's dealing with this accusation that he's, he's not a full-fledged apostle. He came later. So his authority isn't complete. Well, if his authority isn't, then his gospel was questioned as well. And that seems to be what's going on here. Certainly they were questioning the gospel, these men. Calvin gives some insight into what occurred. He wrote, it usually happens that deserters from the Christian warfare seek to excuse their own disgraceful conduct by inventing whatever accusations they can against faithful and upright ministers of the gospel. He'd had experience with that. He writes of men who had not been admitted to the ministry in Geneva or who had, had been expelled from it for a variety of sins, from laziness to fornication. He says that they wander through France and other places trying to establish their own innocence by directing against us all the accusations they can. They did that, and there were lots of people, evidently, that believed them. Maybe something like that happened with these two men. But what is astonishing, astonishing to me as I read this, this statement, is that all Asia joined him. And that doesn't mean everyone, only that the desertion was widespread. But still, after all Paul had done there and done for them, there would be this desertion. Paul wasn't surprised. Still, he must have been greatly disappointed to come to the end of his life and know that he's come to the end of his very fruitful ministry and see, as John Stott put it, a great awakening followed by a great defection. But again, that happens. And when it does, it is a time when men of true faith must stand firm in the truth. Paul did. He told Timothy to do it. It was time for him to be courageous. And to encourage that further, Paul gives Timothy this inspiring example of loyalty in the next verses. In spite of the sad state in Asia, there was a bright spot. His name was Onesiphorus. When all Asia had turned away from Paul, he risked everything to be with him. Paul said he was not ashamed of my chains. He didn't care about public opinion and 
defied the danger of publicly identifying with Paul. Paul knew it was dangerous for him to do that. So he prayed that the Lord would protect Onesiphorus and grant mercy to his house because any harm that would come to him would come to his family as well. Knowing all of this, uh, Onesiphorus accepted the danger, collected as much money as he could, and sailed off to Rome to find his friend and to help him. He was one of those people the Proverbs speak of when it says, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. Onesiphorus was that friend and brother. Still, it was not an easy undertaking. Onesiphorus was from Ephesus and may not have been familiar with Rome. It, it would have been a hard uh, thing to find his way around that great city. You can imagine going to New York City and have, never having been there, what it's like to find your way around the place. I mean, I listen to businessmen talk about the different streets and I'm not familiar with it, but they, they know their way around. But imagine going there for the first time and very easy to get lost. And that's Onesiphorus. Going there was itself fraught with danger. In a recent book titled The Triumph of Christianity, historian Rodney Stark gives a dreary description of Rome. It was uh, the biggest city, of course, in the empire. So it was uh, densely populated and also unsanitary. Sickness and injuries were common. So were criminals. The city was filled with thieves, muggers, and murderers. Just walking the narrow, crowded streets was dangerous. Rome had lots of, of structures built cheaply and too, too tall. So the city was constantly filled with the, with the noise of falling buildings. So as Anesiphorus wandered through that, that dense maze of a city, his, his search was perilous. Germs in the air, thieves at his back, collapsing buildings overhead. And then there was just the difficulty of finding the apostle. It was like looking for a needle in a haystack. Nero's persecution was going on and would have made it difficult to make contact with the Christians there. Many were probably hiding and not wanting to expose themselves to the danger of helping locate Paul. And, and many likely didn't know where he was anyway. Still, Onesiphorus was a determined and good detective. Paul said, he eagerly searched for me and found me. So he was energetic determined in this quest to find the Apostle Paul, and he did. And you can just imagine Paul's joy when he saw his old friend appear in his cell. And having found him, he kept returning. Paul says, he often refreshed me. He stayed with him. Now, the root of the Greek word refreshed is the word soul. So it has the idea of lifted my soul, or cheered my spirits. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, Paul called his thorn in the flesh a messenger of Satan to torment me. Onesiphorus was a messenger of God to comfort him, and he did. The details aren't given, but we can imagine the kind of help that he gave. He would have given physical help with Money, perhaps, food, medicine, and then spiritual help. Uh, maybe he reminded Paul of all the, the truths that Paul had taught him. And they talked about the promises of God that they had. Uh, maybe he sat with the apostle through the long nights, and they prayed together, and they sang hymns together. He refreshed me, Paul said. And that happens. That happens with the saints. I remember 20 years ago, my wife had back surgery. She was in the hospital for two or three nights. And Shirley Mims came down. She was trained as a nurse, had been a nurse in her younger years. And she married Dr. Mims, who was a surgeon. So she was well acquainted with 
patients and what they needed in the hospital. And she came down and she spent the night with her, sat next to her and helped her with everything she needed. Spent a sleepless night with my wife. Well, that's what Paul is speaking of here. That's the kind of service that this man gave to him. And he was thankful for him. He praised him. Anesiphora sacrificed his time. He sacrificed his money, his energy. He put his life in danger by identifying with Paul's chains. And yet, for Onesiphorus, it was no sacrifice. It's what a friend does. Even so, Paul was a unique friend. The one who brought the gospel to Onesiphorus. The one who led him out of paganism into light. Into life. Life everlasting. He was forever in the apostles' debt. Nesiphorus had the, the privilege of learning God's word from the great lion of God. How could he be ashamed of him? There was nothing that he could do to repay Paul for what he had given him, what he had given to his family. So when others were embarrassed by Paul's imprisonment and, and afraid to associate with him, Onesiphorus stepped up, risked everything, sought him out. He was a true friend. Now we could stop here. It's a great lesson and example on what it is to be a friend. He is one who sticks closer than a brother. But there's more here than just being a friend because by being a friend to Paul, Onesiphorus was being a friend to Christ. What, what did Jesus say to Paul on the Damascus road? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, Paul, Saul of Tarsus, had no thought of persecuting Christ. In his mind, Jesus was dead and gone. He was after the church that had perpetrated this hoax of the resurrection, had stolen the body. He was going to crush them. But by touching them, by touching Christ's people, he was touching the Lord himself. And he learned that. And he learned in that moment when heaven complained against Saul that it was, in fact, a real resurrection. He had ascended into heaven. He was alive. And that his church was his body. To touch the body of Christ is to touch Christ. And that's what he was saying. You can't touch my people without touching me. My body is on earth. The head of the church is in heaven. When the body is afflicted, the head feels it. And so he spoke to Paul in that way. And I think that had a very significant influence on Paul's theology because he speaks a great deal of the church as the body of Christ. So it follows, does it not, that if to persecute the church is to afflict Christ, to minister to the church is to minister to Christ. In fact, that's what the Lord taught in Matthew 25, verse 40, that whether we give just a cup of cold water to a thirsty saint, whatever we do for the least of his brothers, we do for him. So when Onesiphorus risked his life for Paul, risked his savings, his family, risked everything for Paul, he was really risking everything for Christ. When he refreshed, refreshed Paul, he refreshed Christ. Now, he may not have realized that. I suspect that he didn't. In that passage in Matthew 25, those the Lord tells, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was in prison, you visited me. They responded, when did we do that? When did we visit you in prison? They aren't aware of the good they did to the Lord. That, that's when he tells them, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And so it is for us. When we are kind to one another, it is considered by Christ 
as being kind and done to him. When we are helpful to what may seem like an insignificant person, it's done for the Lord God. Now that's significant. In fact, nothing we do in this life, I'm speaking, nothing we do as Christians in this life is insignificant. Anessa Forrest may have felt that what he was doing was insufficient, but he did what he could, and it was far greater than he imagined. And it was a great help to Paul when he needed it most, and so Paul prayed for Anessa Forrest in verse 18. The Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know very well what services he rendered in Ephesus. So Anessa Forrest was a, a helpful saint from those early days in Ephesus when Paul was first there preaching the gospel and where he first met him. Going to Rome to help Paul was uh, the kind of thing he was used to doing. He was just a good friend. And Paul hoped, prayed, that the Lord would show him mercy on that day. That, that day is the day we will stand before the Lord at his judgment seat. It's not the great white throne judgment. That's for unbelievers. That is a terrible place to be. This is the Bema Seat of Christ, which is a glorious place to be. It's what Paul wrote about in, in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, when we will be recompensed for our deeds, good and bad. Now, now that is sobering. That's a, a solemn thought, isn't it? That we will be there. We will appear before him. That's as Paul told the, the Corinthians, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, before the Bema seat of Christ. Now, th that should be understood as not for condemnation, but for commendation. But it's a sobering thing that we'll give an account of our lives. And Paul prayed that when Onesiphorus gave an account of his life and of the mercy that he showed to Paul, that, that he would find mercy from the Lord. And you can be sure, at least I feel confident, that Paul's prayer will be answered. And that day will be a, gray, a day of great honor for Onesiphorus and people like him. He was one of the heroes of the faith, a man who didn't write a book of the Bible, and as far as we know, never even preached a sermon. He was what we might call a simple Christian, but he was faithful with what he had and took opportunity when it was presented to him and did what he could because he loved Christ and he loved the Lord's people and used his gift, maybe the gift of mercy, the gift of helps, to visit the apostle. The lesson in that for us is use your gift. And whether or not you're familiar with what your gift is, use the opportunities you have to serve the brothers and sisters in the body. Serve the Lord's people. It, it is serving the Lord in doing that. We can't serve the Lord's people without serving Him. To the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. There's great reward in that. Eternal reward. Nothing that we do in the Christian life Nothing we do in the Christian life in faithfulness to the Lord will go unrewarded. Small things are big things. That was the lesson for Timothy. As I said earlier, this was not told to him in order to memorialize Onesiphorus, but to encourage Timothy to, to galvanize some courage in him. Back in verse 6, Paul told him to kindle afresh the, the gift he'd been given. Uh, evidently, he was reticent in its use. And Paul was saying, don't be silent. Get active, like Onesiphorus. Uh, 
Don't be poisoned by the panic running through Ephesus. Don't follow the example of the, the fearful or be influenced by Phagellus or Hermogenes. Trust the Lord. Walk by faith like Onesiphorus did. A great deal was at stake, nothing less than the gospel, the message of eternal life. It's always at stake. It's always under attack. The wolves are there, or they are coming. Guard the treasure, Paul said. Christian life is a demanding life. It's a life of grace in which God empowers us to live it. Don't live it in our own strength. Can't live any aspect of it in our own strength. We live it 100% in the strength and the power of the Lord God. That's how Paul has encouraged Timothy earlier in this chapter. Nevertheless, the Christian life is a demanding life from us from, in terms of our responsibilities of what we are to do. It calls for knowledge. We must learn the Word of God and know it. Know it in depth. It calls for wisdom, and that wisdom comes from knowing the Word of God and asking God to supply it. And it calls for stern stuff, like denying ourselves and taking up our cross and following Christ. But having said all that, there's no better life than the Christian life. There's no more important life than the Christian life. It is the fullness of life. It requires that we defend God's truth, even if it costs us. Even if it costs us friends, costs us ease and comfort, even our life itself. And we are to encourage, be encouraged by this example. example of The example he gives here of Anesiphorus are people like him. And there are many like him. Martin Luther is another example. He had to stand alone on April 18th, 1521 at the Diet of Worms. One writer called it the greatest day of Luther's life. He had stated his belief that Scripture alone is our authority above popes and councils, church fathers, and tradition. And that was contrary to Catholic dogma. And he was told to recant. He knew not recant, recanting could cost him his life, but after a, a day of thinking it over, he returned to the court with a clear mind and said, I cannot withdraw for I am subject to the scriptures I have quoted. My conscience is captive to the word of God. It is unsafe and dangerous to do anything against one's conscience. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise, so help me God. Well, for that he was declared an outlaw, but God protected him. He gave him many Onesiphoruses to help in his hour of need and the gospel spread throughout Europe. We may be called to stand alone, but in fact, we're never really alone. God supplies us with faithful friends in the body of Christ. And of course, there is no more faithful friend than the Lord himself. Paul knew him, and he promised Timothy in verse 8 that he could do this ministry and take up this challenge that Paul was calling him to. He could suffer along with Paul by God's power, and that power would be supplied. He told him in verse 14 that he could guard the gospel through the Holy Spirit. God supplies as we walk in faith, and He's faithful to do that. He's faithful to do that because He dwells within us. And He's able to make us stand. He could make a, even a poor monk stand well in 1521. And He will make us stand too as we trust Him and walk by faith. It's important that we do, that the church stands for the truth of the gospel. We are called to retain the standard of sound words and guard the treasure that has been entrusted to us. So 
May God give us the desire to do that. May God give us the courage to do that. When we do, we will discover that we have the truest friend of all, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord called His disciples His friends. What a privileged position that is. What an honor, what a title to be a friend, a close companion of the Son of God, of the ruler of the universe. But nowhere in Scripture is Christ called our friend. He's called our Lord and our God, but He's not called our friend. And yet He is. The words of the proverb, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother, are truer of Christ than of anyone. He is the true friend. He is the loyal friend who never deserts us. He is, the, he is loyalty personified. Well, I began with that story of loyalty from Shakespeare. I'll end with another from history. It's a story I've told before, and I tell it periodically because it has impressed me, and it is an impressive story, and it's a true story, and one that illustrates what Paul was teaching here. It's about Polycarp. Polycarp was a Christian minister in the church of Smyrna, one of the seven churches of Asia Minor. When he was a young man, he was a personal friend of the Apostle Paul, or the, the Apostle John. But when an old man, he was arrested for his faith and taken to a Roman court where he was told to curse Christ or he would be burned alive. He was allowed to think about it, but Polycarp didn't need any time to think about it. He replied, Eighty and six years I have served Christ, and He has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my King who has saved me? Bring what you will. And they did. He was led off to His death, and as the flames rose, He thanked God for the honor it was to die for Him. He's another man who will find mercy from the Lord in that day. May we all. The day is coming. Life is a vapor. I was reminded of that yesterday at this same place. We had a funeral, a memorial service here. And I'm reminded of that every time I do those kinds of services. We're all here temporarily. We are a vapor, James says. Or whether we have uh, 70 years or 80 years, if due to strength, we all fly away, uh, Moses wrote in Psalm 90. Every one of you, if the Lord doesn't come, it's going to fly away. You're a vapor. So soon we will stand before our Lord, and eventually we'll be at His judgment seat. May we stand there with honor and hear those words, well done, faithful friend. If you have not believed the gospel that Paul has told Timothy to guard, the gospel that is so important, which is the message of eternal life, of forgiveness in Christ, if you have not believed it, you are not a friend of the Lord. You too will stand before Him in judgment that ends, the Apostle John said, in the lake of fire. That's a terrifying thing. That's a real thing and a terrifying thing. But there is hope. We have the gospel, the good news. It, it, and our hope is realized in realizing our need of the Savior. We're lost. We need a Savior in realizing what He did to save us. Suffering the penalty of sin in our place. So that all one must do is believe in Him, trust in Him. I mentioned this yesterday at this service and explained faith the way I've heard it explained before. And I think it's an excellent, ex it's like an open hand that receives a gift. That's what the Lord requires of us, simply to receive His gift of the full payment of our sins. The moment we do that, the moment we trust in Christ and the merits of His cross, all of that is imputed to us. We become God's children, forgiven forever with a glorious future 
and a secure present, even in the midst of difficulty and danger. Absolutely secure. May God help you to come to Him if you've not. And for us who have, for all of you who have, rejoice in what you have in Christ and serve Him by serving His people. May God help you to do that. Help me to do that. Help us all to be faithful friends. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for your goodness to us and this uh, brief passage about this faithful friend of Paul's is a great encouragement to us and I pray that, that we will follow that example and know that when we do that, when we serve your people, we are serving you. What we do to them, we do to you. We thank you for all that you've given us. We thank you most of all for the gospel of salvation through which we have salvation and eternal life. Thank you for Christ who made that a certainty. It's in his name we pray. Amen.